Hello, and welcome to episode number 87 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacademian. Throughout much of the 20th century, there existed a narrative that ran in parallel, but also somewhat in shadow and away from plain sight to the march of history that we all learned about in school. This parallel narrative spoke of remarkable technological craft, seemingly centuries ahead of our own cutting-edge marbles, and included whispers of encounters with the pilots of said craft, who often both looked somewhat like us, humanoid, bipedal, etc., but also distinctly different, that is to say, alien, with huge wraparound eyes and skin the color and texture of mushrooms. Within 20th century history, the period where we saw these two parallel tracks most oversect, at least initially, was around the turn of what is commonly referred to as the atomic era. If you look at the history of the development and testing of atomic weapons, you will find these others entering the fray, even if in ways that still didn't make much mention in mainstream news publications. Desert landscapes, mushroom clouds, and flying saucers. These all go hand in hand when you consider these two parallel tracks of history. Towards the latter half of the 20th century, another key intersection occurred, one that saw these others, or perhaps another group of others altogether, entering the fray to embark upon some kind of vast but secretive genetic program, a program that saw human beings taken aboard a parent craft and having their reproductive material taken, apparently in the service of the creation of hybrid beings. That is to say, a new creation of humanoid creature that was very much a cross between us and them. These key historical developments have long been rumored about in the so-called back rooms of ufology. That said, they have historically been remarkably difficult to surface for those who have endeavored to see these two parallel tracks considered as undeniably and inextricably connected to each other, which is to say you cannot reconstruct the true history of the 20th century without seeing these two parallel tracks merged into one. This difficulty is largely attributable to the remarkable success of an official suppression and disinformation program that was operated by the government of the American people, or at least elements of it, against the American people, as well as others around the world, throughout much of the 20th century and stretching on into the 21st. In light of events of the last several weeks and months, however, it's now clear that this fight for legitimacy amongst the mainstream has taken a sharp turn. So much so, in fact, that those who've been investigating these matters for decades and decades have been left with their mouths agape, as they've seen these matters seemingly overnight being given true governmental attention and on a bipartisan basis to boot. Much of this sudden movement in a long deadlocked pattern has to do, of course, with the revelations brought forward by a former intelligence analyst named David Grush. His unique position within a generational bureaucracy baked in secrecy has allowed him to surface historical matters that up until now have existed only within the depths of that parallel shadow track. But does this recent development fully explain the apparent urgency we're now seeing play out in the halls of power? Those deeply steeped in legacy ufology have long suspected that some of the very politicians who are now taking action have known about these same matters for years, at least in broad strokes. So that still begs the question, why is this now galloping along at such a breakneck pace? Why is this subject only now garnering what seems to be a truly national focus? To be clear, the surprising pace of recent events which has seen each of the main governmental bodies in the United States in recent weeks publicly take up the challenge of endeavoring to be transparent about this enigmatic part of our history, has left many wondering if something more than meets the eye might be in play here. After all, finally beginning to move towards transparency is one thing, but what we're apparently seeing is arguably much more than that. To be clear, we're now seeing legislation being crafted by some of the most powerful politicians in the nation around what is officially being deemed a disclosure plan. The question is why? And just as, if not more importantly, why now? These are the very compelling and complex matters we'll seek to engage with in this, the 87th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast.
As we begin this week's episode, I'd just like to remind those of you who are interested in accessing all of my material, all of my content, that you can do so by becoming either a patron on Patreon or by subscribing on Spotify. Both of those options will give you access to all of my content, including not just POC and liminal frames, but also my feature series that I do, as well as OTC Squared, again, specifically for subscribers and patrons. Okay, let's jump into this week's subject matter. And as we do that, let's just take a moment to really ground ourselves and be present in the moment we are in, because we are in truly remarkable times. One day we will look back and remember that we lived through this. Generations in the future will look back and remark about the fact that we were the generation that did live through this, that saw this sudden shift in our species, our civilization's understanding of its place in the cosmos, and specifically how that understanding of our place changed right around this time in the 21st century. Now, a few moments ago, I mentioned that this is episode 87. I've done quite a few episodes of this program now, and in many of those episodes, we went into some of this parallel shadow history this history that has been known about by insiders and by those deeply immersed in the ufological history. But again, none of that has really made it into the mainstream, and there are numerous reasons for that, and we'll go into those today. But I just want to remark on the fact that out of all these different episodes I've done, those of us familiar with this material are willing to go into some pretty murky waters to try to uncover some historical moments that are difficult to corroborate and to establish as absolutely having taken place, even though, again, there are lots of evidence suggesting they did take place. I'm speaking, of course, of things like reverse engineering programs, of crashed UFOs and retrieved UFOs, of hybridization programs, even of cooperative programs between different governments and different alien species, or at least non-conventionally human species. Again, the open question is, who are they? One of the really interesting aspects of the hearing that happened this week is that there's this leaving open of the aperture in terms of what their origin might be, what the source of these others may be. And again, as I've said many times on this podcast, for those of you who've been around for a long time, maybe in, since the beginning, I think the universe is teeming with life. And this just marks one aspect of it. So to that point, I just want to point out that as we speak today about these others, these particular aliens, if you will, these non-human intelligences, we're talking about specific historical matters that happened in the 20th century going into the 21st century. This is not the sum total of every kind of non-human and non-conventional kind of intelligence or consciousness that exists. I think there are beings that exist on a variety of different sort of dimensional levels. We experience them through various means. But here we're speaking specifically about beings that do interact in what appears to be our manifest physical consensus reality. That's what we're speaking to. And again, we're talking a lot about the revelations brought forward by someone named David Grush, our former intelligence analyst who gave groundbreaking testimony first on News Nation with an interview with Ross Coulthard and also in an article penned by Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane detailing some of his claims. Now, while the article actually was published first, that interview was actually recorded beforehand, just to make note of that. That was one thing. That was one key piece of history. And those of us in ufology, again, were shocked, amazed, enthralled with these revelations that someone like David Gruss brought forward. We were intrigued by the unique way he was able to bring these revelations forward, doing so as a whistleblower, after having had the opportunity to actually craft some of the legislation that would allow for this kind of whistleblowing to happen. So this was a key historical moment, and we certainly recognized the importance, the significance of these two pieces, the article in the brief by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, and the interview done by Ross Coulthard that aired on News Nation. But of course, that had limited exposure, as groundbreaking as it should have been. But of course, all of that changed this week, as I knew it would, as many of us who are familiar with political machinations knew it would as well. And that's because finally we had a hearing take place where David Grush had the opportunity to express these concerns, these revelations, these accusations in front of an official governmental body. And because 
of this specific occasion and who he was speaking before on the record under oath. Now we're seeing it being taken up by the mainstream media, the legacy media, other politicians. We're seeing this now steamroll into additional hearings and whatnot, and we'll get into that. But again, just want to clarify that the shift happened initially with the interview and the article, but really things have hit a completely different level since David Grush, along with Ryan Graves and David Fravor, gave testimony before this governmental body this week. Now, before we get into some of the specifics of the hearing itself, what is this in regards to? Again, these are matters we've been speaking about in ufology for quite some time. It has to do with a long-standing secrecy campaign deep within government, almost at the level of a shadow government, at least elements that exist seemingly almost independently within the so-called military-industrial complex that have managed to historically retrieve both crashed and fully intact UFOs, unidentified flying objects, objects that are clearly are not just phenomena in the sky, not just lights, not just tricks of the eye, but actually hardware, technological craft that have been recovered. And again, the key is that there has been a long-standing, decades-long attempt to re-engineer these craft. And again, drawing your attention back to the original interview that David Grush did with Ralph's Coulthard, he pointed to a new kind of Cold War that has been underway where different craft have been recovered in different nation states, and each of those nation states have been racing to try to re-engineer this technology because whoever has access to this technology has geospatial dominance at that point because, again, the technology is just so next generation. That's even an understatement. It doesn't even make sense to say that. As David Faber pointed out, even our material science is not even close to understanding this. So we can't build the craft. We can't even put together the material of which it is made. That's the point that David Faber made in the hearing when he was being questioned about his understanding, his interpretation of what he actually encountered. Now, as the public begins to reflect on the nature of the accusations brought forward by someone like David Grush, what they are trying to reckon with is how there could have been a secrecy campaign not just for one year or two years or five years or a decade, but for 75 years or more. How could that happen? Many people will question that. They'll say large bureaucracies are remarkably bad at keeping secrets for very long. But again, I think people underestimate how unique this situation was and how those involved knew the degree to which this was a once in a life, perhaps once in the history of a civilization kind of level of matter here. And so the degree to which they went to keep the secret was unprecedented in every way imaginable. You'll sometimes hear the expression above top secret bantied about amongst ufologists. What that speaks to is how there was basically a different level of classification above everything else regarding this matter specifically. And you can understand why. If there's any of us that perhaps can give some sort of credence to the notion that at least initially there is reason to keep this secret, it's that those who stumbled across this discovery of these craft that were centuries ahead of us in many ways, there was this recognition that whoever gained access to this, whether it was the Nazis during World War II or the Soviets in the Cold War, would control the world. I'm not saying that justifies the secrecy, certainly not this long of a secrecy. But initially, there was this recognition when you put yourself in their shoes that they had come across something so groundbreaking, so civilization changing that they doubled down. They went to incredible lengths to lock this in secrecy programs. And again, part of the history is interesting because we remember that things like the Cold War were going on while these things were being discovered. And that according to accounts from the time, there was this recognition that we were falling behind in some ways. At least there were concerns we were falling behind technologically behind our adversaries. There was this kind of quick decision, therefore, made to pass this material on, this debris and even sometimes fully intact craft, to defense contractors, to American defense contractors, in hopes that they could make sense of it. And again, when we consider this within history, there were concerns at the time that the Soviets had infiltrated different aspects of the intelligence services, for instance, within the United States. So because of that, this was given extreme care in terms of secrecy. 
Now, looking back, many of us would say, of course, it went far too far. One of the major accusations that David Grush makes is that people have even been killed to keep this secret secret. And even before that, of course, there's been plenty of character assassination and elements of the government seemingly engaging in kind of mafia-like behavior to keep the secret secret. And that brings me to something I posted on social media this week. I said, quote, For those who say there's no way you could keep a secret like this for 75 years, just remember, number one, intimidation, ridicule, character assassination, and even murder were used to contain the truth. And number two, elements have leaked all along. It's just that no one was taken seriously, partly because of the very reasons just described above. So this is a key element here. Various elements have leaked out. This is what was ironic about Grush's original testimony in the News Nation interview, was that many skeptics and cynics said, no way, this is ridiculous. This just sounds like the usual fare we're hearing in the back rooms of ufology. But that's, of course, not because it was make-believe or science fiction, but because what had made its way into the back rooms of ufology was actually true. Indeed, much of what Grush's testimony offers us is actually confirmation of elements we long believed to be the case. Again, as I said at the outset of this episode, I've done many episodes on these very matters because these kinds of elements have leaked out into ufology. And now what we have is official, credible confirmation of these matters from someone who is so credible that even though we're now seeing different governmental platforms try to discredit him, try to slow him down, they have not been very successful because he seems so above reproach. And now we have Congress people who are hungry, who have seen the light to some degree. They now know there is a there there, as we say, and they're going to take their next set of actions accordingly. And we will get into that. Again, it certainly seems to suggest that the genie is out of the bottle. There's no way it's going back in. No doubt to the great chagrin of those secret keepers that wanted to keep this secret and are wondering to themselves how this seemed to unravel so quickly after having been kept secret so successfully for so long. Now, again, that also points us in the direction of asking, is there another reason why this is happening the way it is and why it's happening so quickly specifically? And again, we'll get into that later. But let's first break down the hearing itself a little bit more. First off, I want to remark on something that many people have remarked on, and that is the decidedly bipartisan approach. And not just technically bipartisan, but even the spirit in the room that day seemed to be different than rather than being adversarial, Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative, we actually saw people coming together, rallying around something that was, of course, of the greatest interest to humanity itself, not just to Americans, but all human beings. And we sense that in the hearing itself. And I think that at least shines a light on a possible opening we have here for progress as a species, that this matter could be the one that unites us, that begins to get us to focus on matters that matter to all of us. And that maybe, just maybe, that shift in perspective catches on. And maybe, just maybe, we begin to look at different matters through that same kind of lens. One can hope anyway. But speaking of this bipartisan approach, it was certainly striking to me to see people as divergent as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez right alongside Matt Gates, and both of them asking really important questions, really good questions, some of the most penetrating questions of people like Rush, along with Fravor and Graves, to try to really uncover this matter, and not just uncover it, but to come up with ideas about what should happen next. How can we begin to pull at this thread so more and more becomes unraveled? How do we really get to the root of this rotten fruit within our system, within the military industrial complex? You really get the sense that both Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Matt Gates both wanted that. Of course, right along with people like Tim Burchett and Anna Luna. But what was interesting again about Ocasio-Cortez, AOC as she's known, and Matt Gates is that these two are almost polar opposites. They are the epitome of the extreme right wing and the extreme progressive left wing, at least in terms of how each group would portray the other. But to see them coming together, to see their two faces in the same hearing, first of all, just these faces that we're used to seeing within American politics and the mess that it is, but to see them in a UFO hearing, a UAP hearing, 
around crash retrievals, around recovery of bodies, of non-human intelligence, biologics, as the term was used. This is remarkable that these people we see in our everyday news going on in our nation politically, actually appearing at a hearing like this and asking penetrating, deeply provocative questions that seem to uncover or at least point to this shadow aspect of our government that both of them have different reasons for wanting to get to the bottom of. So again, this was a remarkable moment in American history, and I certainly made note of it. Now, leading up to the hearing, there was conversation, rumors about the possibility of new material being presented, new nuggets of information, or perhaps even photographs or video. Of course, we didn't see photographs or video, but we did have the introduction of a new element of the lore that we can add to our lore. And this came from Ryan Graves, actually, who mentioned a 2003 Vandenberg Air Force Base UFO sighting during the hearing. What it involved was a large group of Boeing contractors witnessing a 100-yard red square UFO approach the base from the ocean. This was really remarkable, something the size of a football field, but a cube, a red cube, again, defying all of our understanding of how objects like that could stay aloft. Now, speaking of Graves, of course, since his time in the Air Force, he's now started up a nonprofit that is taking up the concerns of pilots, both commercial and military, in regard to this matter of UFOs slash UAP. And he made a very key point. He said, from his perspective, 95% of pilots are still not reporting to this day. And why? Because the stigma still exists. And when you think about only 5% of pilots actually reporting these matters, you wonder how underreported this is. Again, it makes you think about a massive amount of data that's slipping through the cracks because of something as ridiculous as stigma. And one hopes, of course, that hearings just like this will finally help us turn the corner on that historical stigma. But again, I just want to make a point here to make note that 95% of pilots are still not reporting these matters. In fact, some of what's come out of the military encounters is that pilots will actually destroy material before they even get back to base because they don't want it even discovered because then they'll be interrogated. It won't go well. So we're even having destruction of really important data because, again, of nothing more than stigma. And again, this points to just how prevalent these others are in our everyday world. It really is the proverbial pink elephant that no one's really talking about. Now, just to sum up what came out of the hearing, there were seven main points made. Number one, murder to maintain the UFO cover-up. A shocking allegation, of course. Number two, death and injury from working with non-human intelligence tech. In other words, just operating the tech, working with it can cause injury often radioactive or something like that. Number three, non-human craft exist and have been retrieved. Number four, some craft have been intact. We're not just talking about debris fields here. We're talking about mostly intact craft, which of course gives you a huge head start on reverse engineering. Number five, non-human corpses, bodies found. Biologics was the term used. Quoting Grusher, quote, biologics came with some of these recoveries, unquote. Number six, reverse engineering of this non-human tech. Number seven, these materials and these intact craft have been housed within the aerospace industry. Different defense contractors, all the usual names you hear about, have had these craft and have been working on them, trying to reverse engineer them for decades now. Now, while this particular item didn't come up so much in the hearing, I just want to remind us all that Grush, in his interview with Ross Coulthard, did speak to agreements or accords between factions of non-human intelligence and different human insider groups. And I bring that up because in the midst of the conversation about whether or not these craft being seen are theirs or ours, because you've got people like Stephen Greer saying that we have successfully reverse engineered some of these craft for instance, some of the black triangles he claims are actually ours. And if you look closely, you can see rivets and that kind of thing that suggests this is actually man-made, but based on alien recovered vehicles. And the other vehicles, of course, are theirs as the understanding goes. 
But what I would like to suggest is another possibility, and that is what I call COVs, which is an acronym for Cooperatively Operated Vehicles. I don't hear many people talking about this, but I've heard some ruminations about this from some of the sources I'm aware of, that actually some of these craft may be cooperatively operated between them and us. That is to say, elements within the military industrial complex and some faction of non-human intelligence. And again, this makes sense, at least as a possibility when you think about it, because if we already have accords and agreements, in other words, we already have contact and communication to the point where accords have apparently been arrived at, then it's not a huge leap to imagine at some points there might even be joint operated technology. In fact, I would suggest to you perhaps this is the truth behind the famous Tic Tac incident around the Nimitz, that perhaps what we have there is alien technology, but being cooperatively operated by elements of the military industrial complex, hence why some people seem to know, a very few elite people seem to know what was going to happen that day, while the vast majority did not. The record, I do not think David Fravor knew about it, but I do wonder about others that did know about it. We think again about the people that showed up so quickly and confiscated all of the data. Why did they know about it? How did they know about it so quickly? Again, I want to surface the notion that perhaps that was a cooperatively operated vehicle between a faction of non-human intelligence, or at least non-conventionally human intelligence, again, leaving the aperture open, and elements of this shadow government, this military industrial complex element that may have made these accords, or perhaps even more than one of these accords, and perhaps even more than one of these groups. Again, there's much we don't know, but we have to keep the aperture open. We have to consider these possibilities. Now I want to address something that I've seen being raised quite often in our community, and it has to do with this notion of a national security threat. Some people are very concerned that this is being framed in that kind of language. And I completely understand that kind of thinking, that kind of concern. I certainly don't think we should lead to the conclusion that this is a threat. In fact, I will get to the point in the end where I make the argument that it mostly is not. But I want to remind people of context here, because as they say, context is king. And I want to remind people that this was literally the Subcommittee on National Security, the Border and Foreign Affairs hearing. So within that context, I can understand why it would make sense for them to discuss at least the potential of this being a national security threat. And in terms of potentials, you certainly understand that if any kind of actor can bring vehicles into American airspace and act with impunity and demonstrate technological innovation and prowess that makes child play of anything we put up in the sky, then certainly at least potentially you can understand why that would be considered a potential national security threat. And to the credit of each of the men there as witnesses, Graves, Favor, and Grush, all three of them said it's a potential threat indeed. And that makes complete sense. I think that's appropriate based on the actual context of this hearing. Again, this is a congressional hearing, members of Congress, they are there to protect supposedly the American Republic, to guard against all threats, foreign and domestic. And so they need to be made aware of these things. And I've made this point before with people like Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon, that they're not trying to drum up, much as I hear this being bantied about within ufology, this national security threat as a kind of false flag. I think that does happen within certain elements and certainly Elements of the military industrial complex love to produce new threats because that will give them additional funding to keep going with what they've been doing. But when people like Elizondo and Mellon have come forward bringing this notion forward that it's at least a potential national security threat, they're doing so so as to behoove Congress to at least pay attention, to at least investigate. We can never get to the point where we ask the bigger questions unless the American people are made aware of this. And as we've seen, this kicking around in the back rooms of ufology, as much as it's been true all along, has not been enough to surface this as a national and even international conversation. We need governmental bodies and academics, in other words, official quarters actually addressing these matters. When we get there, then we can finally have the civilization-wide conversations that we need to have. So in that sense, I see this as a necessary means to an end. Now, as that hearing drew to a close and the following days dawned on us, what was the aftermath? 
Now, immediately after the hearing, I posted this to social media, quote, simply put, the compelling nature of this hearing marks an inflection point in the history of our civilization's engagement with the UFO phenomenon. We have entered a new era, unquote. And I think that's key. It's the compelling nature of the hearing that takes us there. It really is an inflection point. I don't think the rest of history will look the same after this hearing. That's how key I think it is. Now, the day after the hearing, we are already seeing various mainstream publications begin to quote from and summarize the nature of the hearing, which prompted me to post the following to social media, quote, we're seeing summaries of yesterday's hearing making the rounds amongst mainstream media today. This is the legitimacy that government hearings provide. David Gruss revealing what he did on a little-known news outlet is one thing. Repeating those same details under oath before members of Congress is something else entirely, unquote. Really, at that point, mainstream media has no choice but at least to cover the summaries of the events like this, because when you have a congressional body actually conducting the business of the nation, that's what media is there to report on. So they have to report on it. And that's precisely what was expected by people like Chris Mellon. I certainly expected it. And now that it's happened, we are indeed seeing the secondary level kick into gear where now mainstream media is entering the conversation. And that also prompts other academics, other people of influence in our culture to also become engaged. In other words, it gets us that much closer to a truly civilization-wide conversation. Now, speaking of Christopher Mellon, who I just mentioned, this is something he posted to social media prior to the hearing. Quote, I think one of the outcomes of this hearing will be that Congress will come to understand the necessity of a congressionally-led investigation to bridge the chasm between whistleblower allegations and Arrow's denials. A good start would be for Congress to ask the ICIG what info it has already uncovered, unquote. Now, speaking of this insinuation, if not outright accusation, that Arrow is acting with less than good faith, and that also means, of course, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who's heading Arrow, this is something else Christopher Mellon said. Quote, the fact that Arrow has not shared satellite imagery of UAP with Congress is itself evidence of an effort to keep Congress in the dark, unquote. Now, very, very interesting, because clearly Christopher Mellon, other people in the know, I certainly had this inclination, and I've mentioned it on Point of Convergence and Liminal Frames before, that Arrow perhaps is not really looking to uncover this matter, not really looking to unearth the reality of the secrets of the legacy programs and whatnot, that perhaps Arrow has been put in place as kind of a internally appointed body to find nothing of real credence. That's basically what some people are suggesting is going on. And there's plenty in the evidence to perhaps at least support that idea. Now, further to that point, one of the most remarkable events that happened after the hearing was that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick wrote a note basically complaining about the nature of the hearing and basically trying to defend he and his colleagues in Arrow. And he sounded quite outraged, even went as far as basically discrediting some of the things Grush was claiming. Now, to those who were on the hearing board, this was quite peculiar and in some ways only played into the narrative that was already forming that perhaps Arrow was not doing its due diligence, was not really interested in the truth. This is what Representative Anna Luna said regarding Kirkpatrick's retort. Quote, We just had a witness, Grush, testify to Congress he was in fear for his life and his former boss, Kirkpatrick, decides to post a letter attempting to discredit him? Seems odd. Kirkpatrick, why did you not follow up on Grush's concerns when he disclosed them to you? Unquote. Very, very interesting. So clearly, People like Anna Luna and other members of that congressional board were convinced they found Grush's testimony compelling to the point now where actually when Kirkpatrick's trying perhaps to do damage control, he ends up doing the very opposite. He ends up supporting the very kind of picture that Grush and others have been painting. And speaking of that, it's quite ironic that 
actually Kirkpatrick posted this letter to LinkedIn. When you think about LinkedIn, you don't usually think about the history of the UFO phenomenon being debated. And yet that's where he posted. Now, why did he post there? Why did he not use Arrow's website? Well, it's because Arrow does not have a website. Remarkably, after these many, many, many months, Arrow has not even gone so far to set up a website, something that takes less than a day to do. You can do it in a matter of hours, which again raises the question, when he says they are open to hearing from any credible witness, why is it so difficult to get a hold of them? Why is there no public number? Why is there no public-facing website? Again, at the very least, it begs the question. It certainly plays into the narrative that Grush and others have been presenting. Now, thinking back to that post that Christopher Mellon made, hoping indeed that one of the eventualities would be that when Congress heard this testimony, they would feel compelled to investigate further, under an official investigation, no less. Well, indeed, that prognostication ended up becoming prophetic, because this is what happened. We have now the proposing of a select committee what are select committees? They are established, usually outside the standing rules, to consider a particular matter or subject and may or may not have legislative jurisdiction. A select committee often expires when it issues its final report on the matter for which it was created. This is what I posted to social media after hearing about this. Quote, those involved in this week's hearing have joined forces in a bipartisan request for the official establishment of a select committee with subpoena power to investigate a lack of forthrightness on the part of the Pentagon and intelligence community pertaining to the matter of UFO slash UAP in light of the credible allegations brought forth by David Grush, unquote. Now, what's key here is not just that a select committee is being proposed and a letter has been sent to Kevin McCarthy to establish this committee, but with subpoena authority, which means that they can demand the people in the know give testimony which is very interesting when you think about something else that David Grush said during the hearing. He said he's aware of witnesses, both cooperative and hostile. What is a hostile witness? It's someone who has information, who is an insider, who perhaps is a secret keeper and has no intention to want to get it out. But when he's called before a congressional board, before a select committee, who knows, perhaps we might even get a joint committee. That would be really remarkable. And he's basically compelled under oath to answer these questions honestly to the best of his ability or face jail time if he does not. This is exactly the kind of teeth we've been hoping for and that now seems to be coming about. Again, for those of us who've been in this for a long time, you can hardly catch your breath because this is remarkable. We're having terms like disclosure being bantied about by politicians. We're having conversations about transparency around the history of UAP in our society and our government's involvement with it in the deep secrecy caverns of the military industrial complex. That was posted to social media this week as one of the three main components that Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, is going to focus on in this next season. That is competition with China, AI, and transparency around UAP. And again, that's the other body of Congress. That's the Senate, whereas this hearing was in the House. Remarkable times indeed. So as we look forward to something like a select committee, I would just point out that one of the other positive outcomes of this hearing is that many witnesses, and there are numerous ones, that were preparing, at least considering coming forward to give their testimony, were pleasantly surprised by how Grush, Fravor, and Graves were treated by the committee. They were treated with respect. They were treated as the veteran service people that they are. And this is now encouraging others to come forward as well. So you can expect the floodgates to open from here. Again, you're not going to be putting this genie back in the bottle. Now, as we turn towards the end of this episode, I want to consider what I proposed in the beginning. This might not just be about new revelations that are prompting new investigations, that there might be something more going on, that the pace with which this is being addressed and put forward in our culture as a major concern, a major matter that the nation wants to pay attention to, that politicians are basically highlighting this issue, not begrudgingly acknowledging it, as has been the case for decades, 
but actually they are taking the front foot and saying the American people deserve to know about this, which again speaks to the fact that there is a there there that they want us to know about. Again, the question is why and why now? And to add to that question, I want to bring some more context to the mix that you often don't hear in other places, at least the places that only consider official congressional testimony, for instance. First of all, I want to make the point that to have the most comprehensive, full view, you need to consider not just official sources, but also testimony being given by experiencers. Experiencers have a unique capacity to understand what's going on here. In fact, to that point, this is something I posted to social media this week. Quote, I still see people regularly overestimating how much government and ex-government insiders truly understand about the UFO phenomenon, while underestimating how much various experiencers know slash understand. Regarding official sources, raw data does not equal true understanding, unquote. And then on that matter, my friend James Andoli followed up my post by posting this, quote, this is something I had been communicated to by someone in the Invisible College, stating that some experiencers understand the phenomenon much more than insiders ever will, unquote. Now, to be clear, that's not to say that everything that any experiencer ever says should be taken as the gospel truth. I'm suggesting we look for consensus narratives amongst different experiencers. Any one of us, experiencer or not, is prone to error is prone to engage in subjective interpretation. This is just what it is to be human. Experiencers experience that, as do non-experiencers. But when we see numerous experiencers, a data set amongst their own, rallying around similar narratives, similar notions that are being communicated to them, that increases the likelihood, it increases our confidence that this is actually pointing to something that is valid intel coming from the very beings we're talking about here. I want to remind everyone that in the midst of this conversation, all the great revelations that have come about, what we are missing in all of this is the communication from the others, from the non-human intelligence. And what experiencers can offer to the community, to our society at large, is actual communication from these others. And one of the main narratives that's been put forward by these others time and time again for decades and decades now I'm going to sound like a broken record by saying this, but again comes down to warnings about the way we conduct our affairs as a civilization, that we are nearing some sort of cataclysmic collapse because of our own actions. It's not something that's being doled out on us in a punitive way. It's something we are causing by our actions. When you reflect, for instance, just on one matter, just on climate change alone, and not just the climate, of course, but the ecosystems that depend on that climate, it's very easy to make the argument that we are nearing a kind of biosphere collapse. And is it coincidence that that's the very warning that's been given by these various groups over time? This non-human intelligence has been warning us about that. They warned the kids in Zimbabwe about that. They warned the abductees in the 90s about that. This was 30, 40 years ago. Now we've carried on with our affairs in the same manner we always have. We're much further down the pipe than we were we're seeing the implications, the impacts, the consequences of our decisions, of our actions collectively. And this is happening at the very same time that we're seeing this push for disclosure, even amongst official groups. Again, it begs the question, are the two connected? I also want to bring to your attention my understanding that amongst my social and professional circle, the number of sightings and interactions that are being reported seems to be rising. There seems to be an uptick there. I also want to remind you something that Ryan Graves said in the hearing, that 95% of pilots are not reporting what they're seeing. I also want to make you aware that there's an increase in telepathic downloads amongst the people, again, in my social and professional circles. Now, you might argue that's anecdotal data, and to some degree it is, but I'm noticing what seems like a statistically significant uptick amongst my own social circles. I wonder what you're experiencing amongst your social circles. I also want to point out that what I'm hearing is that some of the people that are seeing things for the first time are seeing it for the first time. These are not lifelong experiencers seeing it again. These are people connected to them that are now seeing it for the first time, which again is very, very interesting. One last piece of data to 
present here is my understanding, again, from within my social and professional circles, that there has been a decided uptick in dreams and visions around biosphere collapse and or nuclear war. Again, that's one of the threats that is posing itself right now, right in the midst of us having this epic made about the life of Oppenheimer. Again, very, very interesting, coincidental, synchronistic elements in the mixture. Of course, we've discussed before how people like John Ramirez, ex-CIA, have talked about this notion of some major event happening around 2027, and that perhaps even the rollout that's been happening in terms of slowly thawing in terms of the government being honest about these matters and now taking a much more front-footed approach is all about 2027, that they are preparing us for something that's going to happen in 2027. Again, not necessarily something cataclysmic, but something civilization changing in its dynamic. What I would suggest to you again is that this is a, speaking of dynamics, a dynamic situation. What may have been the truth, the reality in 2017 when that initial thawing happened may not be the case now. When I look at this situation, it looks an awful lot to me like something is happening before 2027. Something is expected before then, and only that explains the urgency we are seeing presently. And now I'd like to leave you with a few concluding thoughts. Ironically, while many of these reports are coming from the military, one notion that the military has made clear over time amongst their own communication between different military groups is that this phenomenon does not appear to pose an imminent threat. That was their conclusion in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. That has not changed. While they can run circles around our technological vehicles, the best we have to offer, they do not pose an imminent threat. Further to that point, Experiencers who've encountered the beings that are now just beginning to become a real discussion point in our cultural conversation regularly state that they view their encounters, especially in retrospect with the aid of perspective and time, as positive, as transformative even. Now, is ontological shock part and parcel with interaction with this phenomenon? Absolutely, without a doubt. To some extent, this simply goes with the territory, because this represents a bridge to somewhere beyond our conventional understanding, and thus to somewhere fundamentally beyond our evolutionarily and biologically mediated level of creature comfort. But again, discomfort does not equal threat, and the initial ontological shock does not equal ultimate threat. Indeed, perhaps, as Willie Strieber has long suggested, Despite the ontological shock he himself has experienced on numerous occasions, this very break from the existing paradigm of what is and what is possible also represents the greatest opportunity for truly transformative spiritual awakening in the history of humankind. And God knows we could certainly use that, perhaps even need that. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacadamian. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian, signing out.